Um, so Hebrews chapter 10. Let me tell you how I got here, y'all. Let me tell you how I kind of got to this series. If you remember, as we kind of began to put a kind of a close on 2022, we kind of buzzed by Hebrews chapter 11 a couple times. And if you weren't here for those gatherings, Hebrews chapter 11 is, is the hall of fame of faith. And it's where we kind of get this explanation of what faith is. Well, before, if you're ever going to lean into scripture, let me tell you a really good practice to make sure you at least can get some understanding of what the Bible is trying to say. Never isolate a verse just by itself. That, that is really, it's a really bad practice and it leads to some really whacked theology at times when we isolate one verse out of context and start building a framework of theology around a singular verse, not knowing exactly the context in which it was written. That's how some really sideways movements of Christianity have happened throughout the years. At least when you're reading the Bible, you need to read, if you're planted in a, in a verse and you're, it's speaking to you, at least read the chapter before it and the chapter after it, at minimum, to kind of help you set some context for that. I know it's just easy to point and shoot and start just kind of like, oh, God wants me to lead this. Let me tell you, that's a, there's some things in the Bible, you point and shoot, it's going to be bad. Like, there's some interesting things in Scripture that if you just take it out of its context... And if you, and that's why, again, you've heard me say to understand any of it, you need to have some knowledge of all of it because the Bible is a cumulative book from Genesis to Revelation. It all matters. It's all a collective story trying to help us understand the God who gave it to us. But in, in doing that, this past Christmas series in reading chapter 11, I put into practice my own words. And I, and I read chapter 10, and chapter 10 just kind of stuck with me. That wasn't a part of the message that I taught that day, but the words just kind of stuck with me, and it caused me to start asking some questions about my own heart. It's Hebrews chapter 10. Start with verse 19, and we're going to read through, I think, verse 22, 23. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, and it's verse 22 that hit me, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. It's verse 22. Can we, can we put verse 22 back up there? It says, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near. I'm grateful we can be near to God. Come on. That he isn't a distant deity. He's an intimate father. And he says, draw near. And I began to think and, and ask those questions. I hope, I hope you do this as you finish out one year. It's a great time to do it. To start taking some inventory. To start looking at your life. And now, now it's a new year. And, and it's, we're eight days in. That means we're five days away from you breaking your resolutions. Because <laughs> about three days is on average, right? I, I mean, it's maybe a little bit more than that. But, but eight days in, I'm sure you have, we won't call them resol we'll call them goals. Make everybody feel better. We have goals. And I'm sure if you're, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a believer, if you're trying to pursue Jesus, I pray that one of the things that you start a new year on is wanting to get closer to God. I think that even if you don't write it down, maybe it's not in your journal, maybe it's not on, on a board or anything like that, but in your spirit, I hope every day you're desiring to get closer. Come on. That you're wanting to draw nearer and nearer and nearer to God. Did you finish 22 nearer to God than you started 2022? It's a great question. Did you finish closer than you started? Because I know that space from January 1 to December 31 has some stuff in it. Come on. Some stuff. Some things that impact our faith and impact our relationship with God. And, and some things that probably drew us away and some things that probably pushed us near. But as you finish, did you, did you start closer to him. And in my own life and in my own walk, I'm just asking that question. And here's the thing. If, if the answer is, no, I'm not, as, I'm not as near as I was when I started, or maybe I'm not as, I'm not as near as I was in, in 2013. And that 2013, that was, that was a year where 
Things were different. And then you had to start wrestling down. Why? 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 And it was in that wrestling that God kind of birthed this series. And there was a line that God gave me and that I put in my journal that I think to be universally true. You ready for it? Cool. <laughs> Here's the reality. You will never consistently submit to a God you don't completely trust. It's a trust issue. How close we are to God, how connected we choose to remain to him, because he wants to be close to us. And in James, it says, draw near to him, he'll draw near to you, right? Like he, he has proven all throughout his word that he wants to be near to you. So much so, we just celebrated, he became one of us so bad because he wanted so badly to be connected to us. But you will never consistently submit to a God you don't completely trust. And it's the trust that pushes everything over the edge. It's the trust that takes us to the next level. It's trust in God is what changes everything. It's this whole series, I pray, will increase our trust in God. Not our belief in God or our love for God, but our trust in God. Because this is what we have to acknowledge. You can believe in God and even have some measure of affection for God and not trust him. There's people you do that with. There's people you know they exist. You've seen them. You've touched them. You wanted to really touch them. You, you even have some affection for them. You love them because they're family. And somebody told you you were supposed to. But there's people you know they exist. You have love for them, but you don't trust them as far as you can throw them. Whether you want to believe it or not, there is a connection there with God, too. You can believe God exists. You can have some measure of affection for him, but not live like you trust him. And it's only when you really begin to trust him, things begin to shift. When, when, when you trust that what he says is true, no matter what's happening in culture, when you trust what he says over trusting your own emotions, that's when things begin to shift in our lives. Testify, somebody. When, when, you, when you go from beyond just believing beyond just having some measure of love or affection to complete trust. Trust. Active, obedient trust. That's when things begin to shift. Trust. A person who completely trusts God, that's a person that makes the enemy shudder. The devil is not scared of anybody who just believes he exists. Did you know, I can't find a single place in this book where the devil tried to create an atheist. Stay with me. I'm not saying that a lack of belief in God isn't, isn't dangerous, isn't all those things, but there's never a moment in this book where the devil tries to convince somebody he's not real. His game is always to convince people not to trust the one he himself, more than anybody, knows is real. Nobody is more aware of the reality of God than the devil. If you even go back and you look at when sin entered the world, never for a moment did the devil try to convince Adam and Eve that God wasn't real. Look at it. You've, you've seen it a thousand times, but we're going to look at it again. Ephesians, I mean, excuse me, uh, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. God had created everything. Because everything that exists is not because it evolved from an organism. It's because God's breath came into the world. And Adam and Eve had experienced pre-sin life with God. 
they'd experience that full intimate relationship that God desired and designed for us to have in the beginning. For a moment, we got to really live in communion with God. No separation, no barrier. We were in, the, in his presence in its fullness until this happened. Genesis chapter three, start with verse one. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, did he really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you see what the enemy is really trying to do? He's saying, you you can't trust him. You can't trust what he said. You can't trust that you're going to die. See, what God's really worried about is you're going to eat this and you're going to be like him and he's going to be jealous. He, you, you just, this is Satan's line all throughout humanity. You can't trust God. Hashtag Satan. This is, this is his game from the beginning. He, I don't think the, the devil is concerned as much with destroying belief as he is eroding trust. Because the... If you ask me, the main problem in our world is not people who don't claim to believe in God, it's the people who claim to believe in God but don't live like it. That's the breakdown. The people that claim that he exists but don't live like they trust what he says. Trust. It's a trust issue. See, the enemy fears one who trusts God not one who merely believes he exists. The enemy fears one who trusts God, not one who merely believes he exists. It's a trust issue. Trust. I won't, I won't presume that everybody in the room or everybody watching online believes in God. And if you're here and you don't believe in God, can I say, I'm so glad you're here. I can't think of a better place for you to be. I'm glad you're here, and I hope that you feel loved, and you feel like people in here are going to care for you and love on you and and still speak truth into you in a way that's full of grace. But there's a lot of people probably in here. I mean, this is church. You believe in God. You believe he exists, that he created, and all this kind of stuff. Maybe you even have some measure of affection for him. But until you trust him with everything, And by everything, I mean everything, all of it, relationships, money, career, choice, like everything. That's when it changes. That's when it changes. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the more you read through Scripture, the more you see that God, in his love for us, has not demanded that we follow him blindly. He has invited us to trust him completely. Proverbs, this wisdom literature in our scriptures, much of which, most of which, written by Solomon. Notice how often he speaks, not of belief in God, but the the beauty and necessity of trusting God. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. How'd he start? Trust in the Lord. Didn't say just believe in the Lord. Didn't say just have some love for the Lord. I hurt him. No, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. It's a deeper level than just what we think of believing in an existence of something. Keep reading in Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 20. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is the one who, talk to me, church, trusts, trusts in the Lord. Proverbs 28, 25. The greedy stir up conflict, but those who trust in the Lord will prosper. Proverbs 29, 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts 
in the Lord is kept safe. And you could go on and on and on, but it's not just in Proverbs. It's other places in the Old and New Testament. This week, Jasmine reminded me of one of my favorites in Jeremiah 17. This is one of those that you can, you can mark. Jesus ain't going to get mad at you if you write in your Bible, okay? Write in it, circle it, highlight it. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the man who tr- is, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. Verse 7. The blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It's a trust issue. You will never consistently submit to a God you don't completely trust. So here's my question. Do you trust God? I don't need you to answer it out loud, but I need you to wrestle with it. Do you trust God? Matt, how do I know? Well, to me, trust is evidenced by obedience, right? I did youth ministry for a really long time. We used to do this thing every now and then called the trust fall. Anybody ever done trust fall? I think I gave like six kids a concussion trying to, <laughs> trying to do that. And if you don't know what it is, basically you would, you would stand up on a chair or a table or something like that, and then, then you would have a, a group of people on, like line up behind them like on either side with their hands out. And you would do a trust fall, and that person on the chair would just have to fall back and trust. And like sometimes you had to do some math, like, okay, how big is this boy? We need to, what kind of base do we need to create here? And but it, the trust was measured by your willingness to act, to step out. Do you trust God when that, when the Holy Spirit comes and He prompts your heart? Do you do? Do you follow? When you read his word and your heart is convicted about things in your life and sin that is present, temptations that you're letting in, and you know you need to make changes, do you trust him enough? When you got to make hard decisions that might cost you some friends or some money or some, some comfort, do you trust God? Because it'll be the trust that changes everything. But just that reality is hard to wrestle with because most of us got trust issues. Why? Because life is littered with letdown. See, trust is one of those, when you start throwing that word trust around, that's, that's a precious word. Come on. That is a, that's an important word because trust is easily broken and difficult to build. Trust is one of those, man, we all know it. We've all, we've spent months, years, a lifetime building trust, and in one moment watched it crumble. Because that's how, tr- either, either trust we wanted or trust we were giving. And some of us, uh, you, I'm up here standing here saying, do you trust God? And you trust God? Do you trust God? You'll say, man, I don't trust nobody. And if you knew my story, you wouldn't either. Because every time I've trusted anybody or anything, it's let me down. And so I put a wall up. I started to guard my heart. I started keeping everybody and everything as an, at a distance. And if you don't think what you've experienced in your life does not affect how you perceive God, a preacher stands up here telling you about this kind, heavenly father and you had this earthly father that was anything but, and you automatically project that perception of that earthly father. You have to fight against it at the very least. Come on. You say, Matt, you know what? You're asking me to trust God. I can't trust the people I know. I can't trust the people I can actually see. You want me to believe in a heavenly father? I had a father that told me every week, son, I'll be at the ball game on Tuesday. And then you get a base hit, and you're standing on first base, and you And once again, he said it and didn't do it. And every time that happened, your ability to trust in anything began to get shaken and broken. Mom looked at you and said, I promise, honey, this is the last time I'll never do that again. Two days later, to only repeat the same pattern of toxic behavior you've seen your whole life. 
And he's saying, don't ask me to trust anybody. Don't ask me to trust anybody. I know what you're working against in order to trust God. But look at me. He is not like them. Ooh. He is not like them. What's even sadder is there's people that claim to know him that have hurt you in such a way that's eroded the trust that you're trying to have in him. But he is not like them. He's not like them. Look at me. He can be trusted. And my goal over the next several weeks is to convince you of that, to convince you that he can be trusted. And if you're in here today and you don't trust him, my prayer is you just, you just keep coming back and give me a chance to share God's word and maybe us all try to understand who he is. You say, Matt, you know what? I, I, I just don't trust him. He can be trusted. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. You say, no, man, like I can't, I, I can't trust God either because I prayed and I did this. Listen, some of us, we're frustrated at God for not doing something he never, he never promised he would. Because here's the thing. If it didn't happen, he never said it would. You know why? Because there's a lot of things that God can do, but there's some things God can't do. And one of the things that God can't do is lie. God can't lie. God, God is incapable of promising something and not doing it. He's incapable. He can't lie. Look at Numbers 23. We're reminded of this several times in Scripture. But this is in verse 19. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? No, God cannot lie. And if it didn't happen, he didn't say it would. And understanding all that God does and wants to do and desires is a difficult task. And over the next few weeks, we're gonna try to lean into the scriptures, but this is what I want you to know. This Bible reminds me that he has proven throughout centuries, he has proven he will do what he promised. He will do what he promised. That God is a God of promise, but even more so, God is a God of covenant. God didn't just make us promises. God made a covenant with Abraham, Abram, when it happened, that changed everything for all of humanity. And we can't even wrap our minds around this idea of covenant. We, th- we hear promise, we hear contract, we hear all these, but God, God is a God of covenant. And all of the Bible is this, is this covenantal process unfolding throughout history that now we get to be participants in. And next week, I'm going to unpack this whole concept of covenant because it's so foreign to our culture, but there's such beauty in it. And when you start looking at all of the Bible through this covenantal lens, through the lens of the promise, everything begins to explode and take on new meaning. This covenant that he entered with a man named Abram that we now know as Abraham. There's even beauty in the changing of his name from Abram to Abraham, the breath of God in him. Because see, Abraham is one of those people that is listed in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. It says, Abraham trusted God. And if you take it all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, when this, when this all begins to unfold and it says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. And what it says just a few verses later is Abraham obeyed and went. Why? Because he believed God existed because he had some affection for God. No. You know why he went? He trusted. 
as this time would go by, eventually you get to Genesis 15, and I'm going to lean into this and unpack so much of this next week. But it says this, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, even though you promised me I'd have a kid and have this nation. And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. Then he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Then verse six, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. That word believe is pregnant with trust. He trusted God. He trusted God because look at me, God can be trusted. He is not just a God of promise. He's a God of covenant. And today, I just want you to be open to the possibility of trusting the one who made you, formed you, knows you, loves you, and wants relationship with you because he is faithful and he is true and he can be trusted. That this is not a year where I want to increase your belief in God or just deepen your affection for God. This is the year where I want you to begin to completely trust him. Why? Because I can stand before you with certainty as much as I'm standing on this platform and tell you the God I'm speaking of, the God of the Bible, you can trust him. You can trust him. He is faithful. He's faithful and he's true. And everything he has promised will come to pass. Would you stand with me? We're going to worship one more time really quickly before we get out of here. And my prayer is that something begins to swell in you. That this Sunday, this first Sunday that we've gathered in 2023, it serves as a marker, a spark in your spirit to begin, maybe for the first time, to start trusting the God that you're going to hear about over the next several weeks. Or maybe to rebuild some trust that you've let wane or get lost or get stripped. The enemy wants not to destroy your belief. He wants to use the circumstances of life to erode your trust. And God's got you in this place today to tell you one thing, you can trust me. You can trust me. So God, I pray right now that as we usher into this season and we move toward this series and God, over the next few weeks, as we open up your word and we understand the beauty of your promise and the power of your covenant that you've made with humanity through Abram, that God, that new things would come to life and a new lens would be put on us to look at all of our story with. And God, I pray that something would start right now, that you would spark in us a trust. And God, today, may we be reminded that you are faithful and true. Your word never fails and your promises always come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.